Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, we're on session number three. And in this session, it's really starting to culminate into something now. Right? We're going to be evaluating wire damage. And the best place to start is with what type of damage. Right? It comes in a variety of forms. Right? One of the ones I'd like to look at first uh, is heat damage and external heat damage. Sometimes a wire bundle is running next to a hot section, say the exhaust manifold, or maybe it's running down to the transmission and now the transmission overheated and it took the wire assembly with it. Uh, what does that look like? It looks very similar to this. Wires that are just glued to each other, right? The insulation starts to melt, the wires begin to adhere to each other, and you end up with just a bundle or a mess of stuff just stuck together. And as you can see, I start separating this. Yeah, look at that. It's like taffy, right? Just start pulling it apart. All the insulation sticks to each other. Uh, this type of damage, not repairable in the field. Too excessive. You would end up with splices and wire change colors, and it would look horrible. So a uh, good candidate to be remanufactured. So we do have the external heat source, right, which, again, we touch on that one just a little bit just now. And let's look at another type of heat source. And we run into this quite often, electrical overload. Here's a good indication of a circuit that's been electrically overloaded. And we'll see if Katie can zoom in and take a look at that. What's kind of interesting about this overload scenario is it ended right here at the splice. Uh, kind of surprising that it didn't want to continue through another circuit that in the splice but it seemed like it had what it wanted, which was basically a good conductor to ground, and it found it on this wire. This could be repaired in the field. I should say replaced, because you can open this up, right? You would cut it and basically create a new splice point and run a new wire off to its termination point. And that could, again, most likely a terminal of some kind or ground stud, it'll take you there. So electrical overload. Some things to keep in mind about electrical overload. The fuse is in the circuit to protect the wire, not the component. So typically in overload scenarios, what occurs is the circuit has been overamped, right? Which means they had probably a 10 amp fuse in the slot. It popped, they took it out, and maybe they put in a 20 amp. Well, all that did was allow 10 more amps to flow through this tiny wire and melt it up. Something to keep in mind if you're troubleshooting electrical overloads is to create yourself a jumper lead with a, 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 a fuse in it and then lower the amperage of the fuse to less than what it's rated. So in other words, if you have a 10 amp, uh, you might want to create yourself a jumper lead with a 7.5 amp. This way you know you're protecting the circuit and it's rated about 75% of what it should be. So you could be in a pretty good uh, comfortable spot for troubleshooting electrical overloads using an amped test lead. So I'm gonna take this off the table. I think that pretty much kind of covers what I wanted to with this electrical overload. And then we're gonna spend a little time looking at our next culprit. And these little critters get everywhere, right? rodent damage. Uh, we receive a lot of rodent damage. And in front of me, I have an assembly that we have from a customer that's experienced exactly that, rodent damage. Uh, if you notice, I'm putting on gloves. Obvious reasons why, right? We had a rodent infestation. Another thing to keep in mind as well, uh, if you are going out to inspect rodent damage, bring a mask with you, right? Paper one should be fine. Something similar to this, something to cover the dust. Uh, because they're creating a habitat in the engine compartment or the trunk, wherever it might be. Even interior, I've seen them in glove boxes. So uh, once you open that area and the wind or the air just starts circulating its way in there, it's going to obviously bring all those particles up to the surface. So consider using some type of a dust mask. But let's take a look at what these folks do in there, right? There is a good indication. It's surprising the amount of damage they can do. And this particular rodent, boy, he had more in mind than just the insulation. He attacked the, the copper leads and everything. Uh, obviously, they were having fun in there. So uh, what do you do in circumstances like this? Well, if you can repair it in the field, do so, obviously. If not, we're going to end up replacing all these circuits here. 
we're going to remanufacture or reprocess this assembly. We're going to strip it down. We're going to build it back up again. Kind of unique. I'd like to know what they did with this one. Looks like they walked away with half the half the circuit here. So I don't know where that ended up. But rodent damage, uh, some things to keep in mind. One is the reason we ask ourselves why, right? Why do rodents attack wire? Well, we were wondering that, so we contacted our wire manufacturer just north of us, and uh, we told them the scenario. Uh, they got back to me in about 24 hours. and said, hey, Mr. Dumelli, I think we have an answer for you. Let me explain the process uh, behind manufacturing wire. So they get these the conductors all formed and shaped, and then they need to put the insulation over it. And the insulation is pretty much like hot plastic, right? So as they start putting the insulation over the, the conductors, uh, it, it's a little globby, right? really has no definitive shape to it. So they start running it through a series of dies. And every time they run it through a series of dies, they're getting a nice circular circumference and they're getting a particular wall thickness, right? How thick is the insulation? Well, to keep that insulation from adhering to the dies, they use one of two releasing agents. Either it's a peanut oil-based product or a sodium-based product. And I think that kind of summed it up, right? Planters has nothing on wire, I'll tell you that. Uh, also, the insulation is made of soybean. It's a soybean-based product, so it's a smorgasbord in there for them. Uh, the OEMs are starting to realize that, and they are taking certain precautions. They're looking at alternatives uh, to the soybean-based uh, insulation that they were currently using. Uh, they've, they're now applying uh, some rodent tapes uh, onto their assemblies in areas that they probably had a lot of feedback uh, on. But I think really the best deterrent is Mother Nature. Right? What do I mean by that? Well, there's products in the marketplace now that you can spray in your engine compartment that would deter a rodent from coming into uh, and come into your engine compartment and nest. And it's red fox urine. Uh, now, you could find red fox urine at your local hardware store. Uh, I'm pretty sure you could find it at a lot of uh, sporting shops. And, of course, I'm positive it's on Amazon. I mean, for crying out loud, they have just about everything, right? So you probably find it on Amazon as well. But you spray this around in the engine compartment and rodent be gone. Uh, quick background on that. My neighbor had moles uh, and they were driving her absolutely batty. And I suggested you know, buy some red fox urine. And she did. And she poured it literally around the mole holes and mold be gone. So, yep, it does work. Uh, I strongly suggest you go out and get yourself some. Uh, we've had repeat customers. Right? We've had scent harnesses. We've seen them come back two to three weeks later, same type of damage. So rodent damage, uh, keep us in mind. Let's look at another form of damage, and that's connector damage. And here's a good example of some connector damage. Clearly, the housing has been shattered, right? And what do you do in circumstances like that? Does this mean I have to throw this out and buy a new wire harness assembly? No. What it means is we have an opportunity here to replace it. We have an opportunity to do a very effective repair uh, that allow us to pull this vehicle back in service. And I'm going to demonstrate what that would look like. So this is my replacement housing, and this is my damage connector. So I'm going to go into this damage housing, and I'm going to extract the secondary locking tab. And then I'm going to go into there with my extraction tool, and I'm going to remove every wire lead one at a time, making sure that I'm putting it in the correct pin position. Extremely important. So in my hand, I kind of orientate them in the same manner as I'm depinning them. So I'm going to go one by one, and I'm going to pull that out. Again, dealing with the damaged housing, so it gets a little tricky. So I pull it out of one cavity, and I'm putting it right back into the other. I'll go to the next one. Same thing, right back into the next cavity. Audible click. Remember that audible click I was speaking about a couple of days ago? Well, it's back. And this one's really damaged. Uh, it's back and I'm listening for it now, right? Boom, another one. All right, go one more hole and oh, Hold on, I got something that's worth mentioning at this point. So I'm swapping these wires. I don't know if Katie can zoom in on that. But I'm swapping these wires 
individually, one at a time, trying to maintain my, my circuit count, maintain my correct pin position, and then I just came across a seal. This is a cavity plug. These are extremely important. They do a lot of things outside of making it look pretty. Uh, it's going to keep a lot of moisture out of, that engine, uh, out of this connector housing. So I'm going to go in there, and I'm going to pull that out like I would a wire lead, and I'm going to pop it in there. Boom. You can't forget the cavity plugs. Extremely important. So be patient. Take one connector, one wire at a time. Move yourself methodically through the replacement of the housing. So I'm going to continue. I'll go to the next one. All right. Get to that one. Again, trying to stay in order. Okay. I'm going to put that one back in place. Audible click. And I'm down to my last wire lead now. I'm going to pull that one out. And, well, well, what do you know? This one has a little bit of damage to it. Why bother trying to replace it? I'm going to take a new wire lead that was provided with the replacement housing and use this instead. All right? Why not? It actually looks better. Factory crimped. I don't have to worry about repositioning a damaged terminal. And I'm just going to go ahead and slide that in place. Audible click. Lock it in place. And there you go. Ready to go. Now, obviously, I did this in a clean environment, very controlled. When you're out on the vehicle and you're working in the shop and you're underneath the hood, this takes a little bit longer than what I just demonstrated. But very effective, right tool for the right job. Let's look at the other or third type of type. Well, actually, I think I went deeper than I'm four or five deep now. Uh, wire damage. And I'm going to throw two rules at you, the six and the six. The first rule is no repairs within six inches of a termination point. What's that termination point? It could be a connector. It could be a ground stud. Or it could be a component. In any case, no repairs within six inches of this termination point. Why? Well, appearance, for one, it just doesn't look right. And I have to tell you, if it doesn't look right, it isn't right. And that's probably the best way to go about a lot of wire repair. If something doesn't appear to be correct, I would go in there and I'd research it further. But really, the key reason is the resistance drop between this splice and this terminal. As we pass current through this wire, there is going to be a subtle drop or hiccup in this splice. Okay, got it. And then there's another hiccup at this terminal where they mate. Well, this hiccup, they calculated for that one. They didn't calculate for this one. So let me give you an example. We had a customer that was complaining that one headlight was turning on faster than the other. And they replaced the light bulb. They replaced the lamp assembly. And then finally, they got down to the wire harness. They shipped us to the wire harness. And what did we find? A series of splices. And one of them within six inches of a termination point. And when we started going through the circuit, that repair that was within six inches of a termination point was leading to the HID or the ballast on the headlight. Essentially what was happening was, it was creating that hiccup effect. When they would turn the headlights on at night, the left would charge faster than the right. There's a capacitor basically on each headlight assembly that charges up and gives you that high intensity discharge that you look for in your light bulbs. Well, it was just enough that the charge rate was larger on one side than the other, or faster, I should say, and thus the result. So the six inch rule. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the next one is the six wire rule. And this one probably gets violated more than the first. <clears throat> Katie, can you hold for a minute? 